Okay, I think we got it here. Hello, good evening, and welcome to all of you. Uh, this is Tad. It is Sunday at 7 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time, now that we just finished up Daylight Savings last night. And we are here, and I hope you have been able to find this if you are trying to find the live broadcast. Um, if not, of course, you may be watching this later on, on YouTube or some or on Facebook or whatever, and that is fine also. Or you may be completely ignoring me, which is also fine. God knows the world hasn't suffered any from ignoring me. Not never. Um, I don't think anybody has suffered from ignoring me. Um, but anyway, so I'm glad those of you who are not ignoring me at the present have decided to join me, and I am very happy to have you. I am exhausted, <laughs> but not for any bad reasons. Um, I had the obvious late night last night because of the broadcast, and then had to get up early today because we went to a birthday brunch for some a dear friend of ours and her dear friend who she is married to, and they are two of our favorite people. And uh, we went to uh, go there and just got back about 5.30 or so. Um, so needless to say, the dogs were very happy to see us. They had had company for the earlier part of the day, but then um, our daughter went out and the dogs had to be left in the room. And of course, since they don't speak English except in a very limited way, they had no idea of knowing that we were going to be home very soon. So as far as they could tell, we had just abandoned them. That always seems to be uh, Big Dog Johnny's first thought is, yes, this time they're never coming back. This time they have abandoned me. I know it. It's okay. I'll learn to live with it. No, I won't. I'm miserable. Um, whereas Walter, although he is also usually pleased to see us when we come back, his, his, his worries are less. And what he really wants is just a human being to crawl into bed with or anything large. I mean, you know, a, a, a very large boiled beef carcass would probably do just as well as me as far as Walter is concerned or a very large... 180 pound hot water bottle, which is essentially what I am. Um, again, as far as Walter's concerned, I'm hoping there's some other people and in my life, um, if not my animals, who see me as something other than a 180 pound hot water bottle. But anyway, so we just got back from that. I gulped down a cup of coffee so I can be at least somewhat coherent. Uh, if I was entirely coherent, it's quite possible no one would know it was actually me. But I needed to get as close to coherence if that's the correct word, as possible. So here I am. Um, for those of you who weren't listening to the previous broadcast, there's not a whole lot of news to tell, um, except obviously the Navigator's Children is finally coming out. Hosanna, Hosanna. Um, and uh, I've got my copy, so they must be going out, being shipped out to bookstores and Amazon or whatever other method people use for purchasing books written on paper, strange as they are, um, antiquated as the whole process seems to be, I'm sure, to most younger people. Wait, they're still putting those things on paper? You have to carry them around? And you can't even phone from a book? Why would you carry something you couldn't make a phone call from or browse the internet? I know, I know. It's weird and old-fashioned. But there it is. I'm sure there are also ways for you to find many different outlets that will provide it to you in digital form. But if you want a hardcover actual book, those are also going to be available very shortly if they're not already in stores or being sent out or whatever. So that's the main piece of news, obviously. It's November. And I literally, honestly thought that this book, at one point I thought it would be coming out in November of 2023. So it's been a long burst of patience <laughs> necessary to wait for it. But it's finally there, and I'm very pleased. Um, what else? Working on The Splintered Sun, uh, as I was saying uh, last night, you know, I'm feeling good about it. I feel like I've finally nailed down a lot of the issues. The main issue for me, and I've talked about this before, but the main issue for me in deciding how to tell the story is how many subsidiary characters I can use because I like to use subsidiary characters to tell the story from different viewpoints and from different geographical vantage points and um, you know all kinds of things like that so uh, but if you want a shorter book you need fewer focal point characters um, and uh, indeed as I was also saying I, I would prefer this book to be more like 
somewhere between, say, Tail Chaser Song and War of the Flowers in terms of length. I definitely want it to be a standalone. I don't want it to be the kind of standalone that terrifies people because I'm hoping that I will get to write more of these. So um, that's being worked on, and you know, like 160, 170 pages into that now. And since I'm looking at a manuscript length of maybe 500 pages, that's a pretty good chunk into the story. Again, those of you who know me are already going, oh yeah, Tad, because you're, you're so good at guessing how long these stories are going to be. You're right, I should never say anything. I apologize for my hubris. Um, I'm sure that Zeus is getting a, a lightning bolt ready for me up on Mount Olympus right now. The only person who's actually paying attention to the ridiculous things I say and is planning to punish me for having the unmitigated gall to suggest that I can actually predict how long my books are going to be. I wish I could. But I, I, the only thing I can promise you is it will be the best damn book I can give you. And um, I'm enjoying the characters, I'm enjoying the setting, I'm enjoying exploring Hernestir 200 years before the Dragonbone Chair. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. All kinds of stuff like that. So um, I, I trust or I hope that my enjoyment of what I work on as long as I make that a big part of how I pick stories and how I tell stories, that um, the readers will also enjoy. Um, if I enjoy it, then it will seep through into the, the book and people will feel how into it I was when I was writing. Because there's nothing that depresses me more than the thought of writing something someday and having people read it and go like, oh, he just cranked this one out, huh? You know, oh, he was obviously just trying to, you know, beat a deadline or something like that. I mean, you don't write that many. I'm going to, by the end of my writing life, whenever it happens to come, I will have almost certainly written fewer books than I have lived years. Um, I'm at less than half at this point. Um, and so as a result, like, you know, I'm sure all writers do, but certainly I can only speak for me. I take this stuff really seriously, you know. It's, it goes places I can't go. It speaks to people that I will never meet, but would probably like if I met them in person. Um, it, it is a part of me that I am handing out to the world and saying, here, I hope you enjoy this. I hope you enjoy this combination of factors that made me who I am and made my books what they are. Um, so obviously, you know, it's any, anything that I write seems obvious to me anyway, that anything I write should be the best possible thing I can do because chances are good that I it will, that at least some of my books will outlive me. And that, as I said, that, that my books will go out to places I never get to, to people I never meet. Um, so I want them, I want the best foot forward, so to speak. So I will never write a book that I am not loving while I'm writing it. Doesn't mean I may not look back on some things and go, oh, I could have done that a little better, or oh, I could have done that a little better. But fortunately, I've never looked back on anything I've written and said, oh, I'm sorry I did that, or well, that was a mistake. Um, and that's really all you can aim for when you're in the sort of commercial art business is, you know, you have to do certain things to make a commercial product out of your art, um, you know, to make something that people can sell for you. But at the same time, you know, you got to watch that line because if you go too far in that direction, my feeling is that I can see when other people have written things that they probably weren't totally thrilled with or whether they were thrilled with them but shouldn't have been because they were crap. Um, you know, so you, 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 you try to develop an idea of what is my ideal outcome here and then you do your best to live up to it through the good days and the bad days and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, um, so other than that, everybody in the household, all good. Um, the dogs, after having been freed from their durance vile, I always use that term, it's an old term, meaning nasty imprisonment. Uh, after the dogs were released from their durance vile, they bounded around the house and squeaked and squawked and barked and made all kinds of noises and skidded on the wood floors and they're not even wood really they're like fake wood but they they still are very skiddable for dogs they skidded around and and johnny stepped on walter and walter squealed his outrage and then i accidentally stepped on johnny who you know freaked out because he thought he'd done something wrong and then i 
I don't know why. I don't know why anything that happens to this dog, negative, he assumes he's being told you are bad, poor thing. Um, whereas in reality, not only do we not ever smack him, or anything, we don't yell at him, we don't raise our voice around him because he is the kind of dog who will take it very personally. So as a result, he's gotten an even more severe version of the gentle parenting thing than our actual kids did. You know, because you can explain to kids when they get old enough, okay, here's why I'm upset about what happened. And here's what I would like you to think about the next time you feel like you want to throw a rock through the, the goldfish bowl or, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to explain to your child is a really bad idea and you don't want them to do it. But dogs, you know, that's... It's a very limited set of things that you can communicate to them. And Johnny's first assumption is, I have done wrong. I am guilty. Oh, my great sin, mea maxima culpa. You know, he just goes right to that mode. So I don't, I don't even look at him in an angry way unless he really needs to be brought to attention, in which case I'll give him a hard stare sometimes, like, Johnny, you should not eat your little brother. But uh, beyond that, it, it just, you know, it, it wouldn't do any good. He's already punishing himself. You know, he's self-flagellating like one of those medieval crusade type people, you know, pilgrimage people going along, you know, like in the Monty Python Holy Grail whacking themselves in the head with their boards, you know. It's, that's, that's Johnny. Um, anyway, oh, what was I going to do? I was going to, before I started reading here, I was just going to quickly check and no, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. Why is my news program, my news aggregator popping up? And I don't want that one. I do want this one, but that content isn't available right now. So I want the other one. There we go. Okay. So, so sometimes it will, sometimes it will let me see who is actually checking in. Okay. There's a few. All right, so Christy has checked in. Hello, Christy. Tracy is checking in from Arizona, chilling like a villain. Ah, good plan. Medardo is checking in. Hello, Medardo. Un placer de verte. Uh, Barbara Ann, lovely to see you too. Claudia, hello, hello. Kelly Kenrick, hi, Kelly. Jeremy, hello, Jeremy. Glad you dropped in for a bit. Um, I'm, 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 who else is here? Susan Shamblin. Hello, Susan. I'm doing the, the, the romper room thing here. Isaac says, I made it. I'm here. Hello. Hello. Hooray. Huzzah. Uh, Angie. Hello, Angie. Good to see you. Ray. Good to see you too, Ray. Well, that's Ray Weatherford who has joined us. Marty has sent me a very astounded face. I don't know why. Is that an astounded face because, my God, how did he get so old and weird looking, Marty? Um, or is that an astounded face um, because you didn't know I do this? I've been doing this since 2019. Either way, it's always a pleasure to see you. Marty is one of the people I first met in the science fiction community, and she's a total sweetie and a fine, fine human being. So uh, good to see you, Marty. Nice of you to come in. Ray asks, when will the audio version be available? I'm assuming that you are doing, uh, you're talking about the bop, 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 the Navigator's Children. I don't know on that, but I believe, because see, my, my, my publishers were part of a, a kind of larger conglomerate. They've always been a privately owned family publishing company. This is Daw Books. But they were affiliated with a larger publishing company in the past that they combined resources with and stuff. And it used to most recently be Random Penguin, Penguin Random House, so-called. Um, they have now changed their affiliation to another larger entity. I, Penguin Random House used to use their own in-house things for audio and connections and whatnot. I don't know what's going on, Ray. I will do my best to find out, so thank you for the question. And if I do find out, I'll post it on my Facebook page. So Angie asks, what's the deal with the newsletter? Did we figure that out? Um, I believe so. I believe it's, been a, it's available and has gone out, but beyond that, I don't know. Deborah has kindly taken over. So yeah, Jeremy says, I think the newsletter went out yesterday. Check your spam folder if you didn't get it. Um, and that's about as much as I know, too, yeah, because my publisher, Betsy, did send me a comment about the newsletter. So um, if you haven't found it, let us know, and we'll make sure to send you a copy just directly. 
Um, in fact, Medardo seems to have gotten it because he says, beautiful last newsletter of yesterday. Love to the trees to hold the world whole. Yes, absolutely. Uh, for you, those who don't know what I'm referring to, I, one of the things I talked about in the newsletter was how happy being back with this in this particular property with these trees and this kind of thing. And I realized I've become very um, location centered. You know, it's 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 important to me now to spend my working life up in up in the hills or at least in the trees somewhere. So that's the reference. Uh, Cliff says hi and best to you in the family. To which I say same to you, Cliff. Good to hear from you as always. Um, <laughs> Angie wants to be a fly in my brain. No, I don't think you could deal with that. I think that'd be scary as hell to be a fly, a fly in my brain because it's not just science fiction fantasy I'm constantly thinking about. It's, it's science, it's old baseball cards, it's, you know, theme songs from 1960s cartoons, it's weird rock and roll trivia from the 60s and 70s. I, I, I've got all kinds of weird stuff. If you were a fly, you would be looking for the exit. Believe me, it's got to be cacophony in there. Um, anyway, and Angie also says, Johnny, ah, my poor Johnny. He is a sweetie. That's one of the things I have to say. I, and I think I've told you guys this. I have never been so emotionally involved with a dog because I have never had an, any animal in my life who is as emotionally complicated as Johnny is he just really you know it's it, he is not a dog that just acts like a normal dog everything has got to be thought about worried about considered you know he has all these dog things he does when he doesn't want to deal with something you want him to do but he won't directly defy you so he pretends he didn't hear I mean I know other people have had dogs who do that but in Johnny it's part of an entire behavior of wanting to be good, but at the same time, sometimes just not wanting to do the things that we want him to do, but never wanting to have a direct confrontation with us, like obviously ignore us or, or do the exact opposite. And instead he just kind of gets this like, ah, somebody's talking to me, but I'm, I'm not quite making out the words. Maybe if I leave the room that the people are in, it'll be easier for me to hear what they're saying to me. You know? And then he'll kind of sidle off. And I'm like, Johnny, I just want you to come here so I can give you one of these medicine chews or something. Anyway, uh, Christy says, love the fur baby stories. Angie also says, Johnny is her spirit animal. Leanna, oh, Lena, Lena Taylor. Hello, Lena. Having a holiday at home, so time to listen in. Well, thank you for joining me. I will be reading in just a minute. There's our dear friend, Teresa, says, hi, Tad, miss you and Deb. We miss you too, sweetie, all the time. Um, and things will be calmer now that we're back from traveling and all that. Uh, Melanie, hello. I haven't seen you for a long time. Good to see you and good evening to you. And <laughs> Angie's still waxing rhapsodic about how much like her Johnny is. Well, I hope you have somebody in your life, uh, Angie, who is uh, or uh, in your circle of friends or in your family growing up who who gave you the same kind of helpless, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, just, just support and love because that's all you can do. You know, it, it's you just, you got, you know, pe everybody's different, including animals. Everybody is an individual. Some are more individual than others. But, you know, whether you have a neurodivergent child or a neurodivergent pet or a neuro neurodivergent divergent best friend or whatever, you just got to love them and give them some room, you know? And I learned that lesson with Johnny a long time ago. When I was younger, I might have found it more difficult to deal with a dog who will just kind of sidle away when he doesn't want to deal with you or, you know, who's constantly asking for reassurance. And, you know, I, I'll, it, it, but no, it's just part of the, uh, part of the merry-go-round, part of the carousel of life, you know? Anyway, um, so with that, I am going to return to the Sword in the Stone. Um, pop that up. Okay, so what we have done is we have just finished the chapter about the Christmas celebration, which of course is, is both, and this is the interesting thing about T.H. White's The Once and Future King. It is both very, very deeply embedded in and, and constructed around the reality of medieval life. He is sort of putting this in the post 
Norman period in England, which for those of you who didn't get this in school, 1066 was the Norman invasion under William the Conqueror. And so he's kind of casting um, Uther Pendragon, the current king, as, as a Norman. And the, uh, the resistance, like Robin Hood stroke Robin Wood, as Saxons. But what he's, what he's really talking about, more than anything else, is what he thought thinks was important for you to know about what it felt like to live in medieval England. So even though obviously some parts of this are quite fanc fanciful and fantastic, you know, the griffins and the, the, uh, the fairy soldiers made out of cheese and all this kind of stuff, there's also a huge amount of information. And that is, is one of the things that first drew me to these books. A lot of other things I love about them too, including T.H. White's language, you know, and his, his fascination and his, his strong desire to share his fascinations. Anyway, so we just finished reading the part about the Christmas celebration in the castle of the Forest Sauvage, and it's, they're doing a Boxing Day hunt. Boxing Day, for those of you who don't know, is the day after Christmas. And they are being led by the king's master of hunt who has been sent out and who Sir Ector was originally worried about, Master William Twighty. And that's what's going to happen here. So chapter 16. The wart got up early next morning. He made a determined effort. The moment he woke, threw off the great bearskin rug under which he slept and plunged his body into the biting air. He dressed furiously, trembling, skipping about to keep warm and hissing blue breaths to himself as if he were grooming a horse. He broke the ice in a basin and dipped his face in it with a grimace like eating something sour, said, ah, and rubbed his stinging cheeks vigorously with a towel. Then he felt quite warm again and scampered off to the emergency kennels to watch the king's huntsman making his last arrangements. Master William Twighty turned out in daylight to be a shriveled, harassed-looking man with an expression of melancholy on his face. All his life he had been forced to pursue various animals for the royal table and, when he had caught them, to cut them up into proper joints. He was more than half a butcher. He had to know what part the hound should eat and what part should be given to his assistants. He had to cut everything up handsomely, leaving two vertebrae on the tail to make the chine look attractive. And almost ever since he could remember, he had been either pursuing a heart or cutting it up into helpings. He was not particularly fond of doing this. The harts and hinds in their herds, the boars in their singulars, the skulks of foxes, the richesses of martins, the bevies of roes, the seats or seaties of badgers, and the routs of wolves, all came to him more or less as something which you either skinned or flayed and then took home to cook. You could talk to him about Os and Argos, Suet and Greece, Crotes, Fumets, and Fiance, but he only looked polite. He knew that you were showing off your knowledge of these words, which were to him a business. You could talk about a mighty boar which had nearly slashed you last winter, but he only stared at you with his distant eyes. He had been slashed sixteen times by mighty boars, and his legs had white wheels of shiny flesh that stretched right up to his ribs. While you talked, he got on with whatever part of his profession he had in hand. There was only one thing which could move Master William Twighty. Summer or winter, snow or shine, he was running or galloping after boars and hearts, and all the time his soul was somewhere else. But mention a hare, H-A-R-E, a hare to Master Twighty, and although he would still go on galloping after the wretched heart, which seemed to be his destiny, he would gallop with one eye over his shoulder yearning for puss. In this case, he's using it as a diminutive for bunny rabbits. It was the only thing he ever talked about. He was always being sent to one castle or another all over England. And when he was there, the local servants would fate him and keep his glass filled and ask him about his greatest hunts. He would answer distractedly in monosyllables. But if anybody mentioned a husk of hares, 
He was all attention. And then he would thump his glass upon the table and discourse upon the marvels of this astonishing beast, declaring that you could never blow a mene for it, which is a hunting call, because the same hair could at one time be male and another time female, while it carried grease and crotied and gnawed, which things no beast in the earth did except it. Wart watched the great man in silence for some time, then went indoors to see if there was any hope of breakfast. He found that there was, for the whole castle was suffering from the same sort of nervous excitement which had got him out of bed so early, and even Merlin had dressed himself in a pair of breeches which had been fashionable some centuries later with the university beagles. Boar hunting was fun. It was nothing like badger digging or covert shooting or fox hunting today. Perhaps the nearest thing to it would be ferreting for rabbits, except that you used dogs instead of ferrets, had a boar that might easily kill you instead of a rabbit, and carried a boar spear upon which your life depended instead of a gun. They did not usually hunt the boar on horseback. Perhaps the reason for this was that the boar season happened in the two winter months, when the old English snow would be liable to ball in your horse's hoofs and render galloping too dangerous. The result was that you were yourself on foot, armed only with steel, against an adversary who weighed a good deal more than you did, and who could unseam you from the knave to the chaps and set your head upon his battlements. There was only one rule in boar hunting. It was, hold on. If the boar charged you, you had to drop to one knee and present your boar spear in his direction. You held the butt of it with your right hand on the ground to take the shock, while you stretched your left arm to its fullest extent and kept the point toward the charging boar. The spear was as sharp as a razor, and it had a cross piece about 18 inches away from the point. This cross piece, or horizontal bar, prevented the spear from going more than 18 inches into his chest. Without the cross piece, a charging boar would have been capable of rushing right up the spear, even if it did go through him and getting at the hunter like that. But with the cross piece, he was held away from you at a spear's length, with 18 inches of steel inside him. It was in this situation that you had to hold on. Sorry, I'm trying to make something go away here that won't go away. Um, he, and we're still talking about the boar, he weighed between 10 and 20 score, and this one object in life, and his one object in life was to heave and weave and sidestep until he could get at his assailant and champ him into chops, while the assailant's one object was not to let go of the spear, clasped tight under his arm until somebody had come to finish him off. If he could keep hold of his end of the weapon, while the other end was stuck in the boar, he knew that there was at least a spear's length between them, however much the boar ran him round the forest. You may be able to understand, if you think this over, why all the sportsmen of the castle got up early for the Boxing Day meet and ate their breakfast with a certain amount of suppressed feeling. Ah, said Sir Grumor, gnawing a pork chop which he held in his fingers. Down in time for breakfast, eh? Yes, I am, said the wart. Fine hunting morning, said Sir Grumor. Got your spear sharp, eh? Uh, yes, I have, thank you, said the wart. He went over to the sideboard to get a chop for himself. Come on, Pelinor, said Sir Ector. Have a few of these chickens. You ate nothing this morning. King Pelinor said, I don't think I will. Thank you all the same. I, I don't think I feel quite the thing this morning. What? Sir Grumor took his nose out of his chop and inquired sharply, Nerves? Oh, no, cried King Pelinor. Oh, oh, no, really, not that. What? I, I think I must have taken something last night that disagreed with me. Nonsense, my dear fellow, said Sir Ector. Here you are, just you have a few chickens to keep your strength up. 
He helped the unfortunate king to two or three capons, and the latter sat down miserably at the end of the table, trying to swallow a few bits of them. Need them, said Sir Grumor, meaningly. By the end of the day, I dare say. Do you think so? No, so, said Sir Grumor, and winked at his host. The wart noticed that Sir Ector and Sir Grumor were eating with Roger rather exaggerated gusto. He did not feel that he could manage more than one chop himself, and as for Kay, he had stayed away from the breakfast room altogether. When breakfast was over and Master Twighty had been consulted, the Boxing Day cavalcade moved off to the meat. That's meat, M-E-E-T. Perhaps the hounds would have seemed a, rather a mixed pack to a master of hounds today. There were half a dozen black and white allants, which looked like greyhounds with the heads of bull terriers or worse. These, which were the proper hounds for boars, wore muzzles because of their ferocity. The gaze hounds, of which there were two taken just in case, were in reality nothing but greyhounds, according to modern language, while the limers were a sort of mixture between the bloodhound and the red setter of today. The latter had collars on and were led with straps. The breeches were like beagles and trotted along with the master in a way that beagles have always trotted, and a charming way it is. With the hounds went the foot people. Merlin, in his running breeches, looked rather like Lord Baden-Powell. Insert here, that's the guy who founded the Boy Scouts. Merlin, in his running breeches, looked rather like Lord Baden-Powell, except, of course, that the latter did not wear a beard. Sir Ector was dressed in sensible leather clothes. It was not considered sporting to hunt in armor. And he walked beside Master Twighty with that bothered and important expression which has always been worn by masters of hounds. Sir Grumor, just behind, was puffing and asking everybody whether they had sharpened their spears. King Pellinore had dropped back among the villagers, feeling that there was safety in numbers. All the villagers were there, every male soul on the estate, from Hob, the Ostringer, down to Old Watt with no nose, every man carrying a spear or a pitchfork or a worn scythe blade on a stout pole. Even some of the young women who were courting had come out with baskets of provisions for the men. It was a regular Boxing Day meet. At the edge of the forest, the last follower joined up. He was a tall, distinguished-looking person dressed in green, and he carried a seven-foot bow. Good morning, master, he said pleasantly to Sir Ector. Ah, yes, said Sir Ector, yes, good morning, hey, yes, good morning. He led the gentleman in green aside and said in a loud whisper that could be heard by everybody, For heaven's sake, my dear fellow, do be careful. This is the king's own huntsman, and those two other chaps are King Pellinore and Sir Grumor. Now, do be a good chap, my dear fellow, and don't say anything controversial. Will you, old boy? There's a good chap. Certainly I won't, said the green man reassuringly, but I think you had better introduce me to them. Sir Ector blushed deeply and called out, uh, uh, Grumor, come over here a moment, will you? I want to introduce a friend of mine, old chap, a chap called Wood, old chap. Wood with a, a W, you know, not an H. Yes, and, and this is King Pellinor, uh, Master Wood, King Pellinor. Hail, said King Pellinor, who had not quite got out of the habit when nervous. How do said Sir Grumor. No relation to Robin Hood, I suppose. Oh, oh, no, no, not in the least, interrupted Sir Ector hastily. W-double-O-D, you know, like, uh, like the stuff they make furniture out of. Furniture, uh, you know, and, and, and spears. And, and, well, spears, you know, and furniture. How do you do, said Robin. Hail, said King Pellinor. Well, said Sir Grumor, it's funny that you should both wear green. Yes, yes, it is funny, isn't it? said Sir Ector anxiously. He, he wears it in mourning for an aunt of his who died by falling out of a tree. Beg pardon, I'm sure, said Sir Grumor, grieved at having touched upon this tender subject 
and all was well. And now, then, Mr. Wood, said Sir Ector when he had recovered, where should we go for our first draw? As soon as this question had been put, Master Twighty was fetched into the conversation, and a brief confabulation followed in which all sorts of technical terms like lesses were bandied about. Then there was a long walk in the wintry forest, and the fun began. Wart had lost the panicky feeling which had taken hold of his stomach when he was breaking his fast. The exercise and the snow wind had breathed him so that his eyes sparkled almost as brilliantly as the frost crystals in the white winter sunlight, and his blood raced with the excitement of the chase. He watched the limerer, who held the two bloodhound dogs on their leashes, and saw the dogs straining more and more as the boar's lair was approached. He saw how, one by one, and ending with the gaze hounds, who did not hunt by scent, the various hounds became uneasy and began to whimper with desire. He noticed Robin pause and pick up some lessons, which he handed to Master Twighty, and then the whole cavalcade came to a halt. They had reached the dangerous spot. Boar hunting was like cub hunting, to this extent that the boar was attempted to be held up. The object of the hunt was to kill him as quickly as possible. Wart took up his position in the circle round the monster's lair and knelt down on one knee in the snow, with the handle of his spear couched on the ground, ready for emergencies. He felt the hush which fell upon the company and saw Master Twighty wave silently to the limerer to uncouple his hounds. The two limers plunged immediately into the covert which the hunters surrounded. They ran mute. There were five long minutes during which nothing happened. The hearts beat thunderously in the circle, and a small vein on the side of each neck throbbed in harmony with each heart. The heads turned quickly from side to side as each man assured himself of his neighbors, and the breath of life steamed away on the north wind sweetly as each realized how beautiful life was, which a reeking tusk might, in a few seconds, rape away from one or another of them if things went wrong. The boar did not express his fury with his voice. There was no uproar in the covert or yelping from the limers. Only about a hundred yards away from the wart, there was suddenly a black creature standing on the edge of the clearing. It did not seem to be a boar particularly, not in the first seconds that it stood there. It had come too quickly to seem to be anything. It was charging Sir Grumor before the wart had recognized what it was. The black thing rushed over the white snow, throwing up little puffs of it. Sir Grumor, also looking black against the snow, turned a quick somersault in a larger puff. A kind of grunt, but no noise of falling, came clearly on the north wind, and then the boar was gone. When it was gone, but not before, the wart knew certain things about it, things which he had not had time to notice while the boar was there. He remembered the rank mane of bristles standing upright on its razor back, one flash of a sour tush. By the way, sorry, just to insert again, tush is tusk. It's, it's an old word for tusk. One flash of a sour tush, the staring ribs, the head held low, and the red flame from a piggy eye. Sir Grumor got up, dusting snow out of himself, unhurt, blaming his spear. A few drops of blood were to be seen frothing on the white earth. Master Twighty put his horn to his lips. The allants were uncoupled as the exciting notes of the mene began to ring through the forest, and then the whole scene began to move. The limers, which had reared the boar, the proper word for dislodging, were allowed to pursue him, to make them keen on their work. The breaches gave musical tongue. The allants galloped, baying through the drifts. Everybody began to shout and run. Avoy! Avoy! cried the foot people. Shahoo! Shahoo! Avant, sire! Avant! Swift! Swift! cried Master Twighty anxiously. Now, now, gentlemen, give the hounds room, if you please. I, I say, I say, cried King Pellinore, did anybody see which way he went? 
What, what, what an exciting day. What? Ça, 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 y vont. Ça, ici, y vont. Ça, ici, y vont. Hold hard, Pelinor, cried Sir Ector. Where hounds, man, where hounds? Can't watch him yourself, you know. Il est haut, il est haut. And till et ho, echoed the foot people. Tilly ho, sang the trees. Tally ho, murmured the distant snowdrifts as the heavy branches, disturbed by the vibrations, slid noiseless puffs of sparkling powder to the muffled earth. The wart found himself running with Master Twighty. It was like beagling, in a way, except that it was beagling in a forest where it was sometimes difficult even to move. Everything depended on the music of the hounds and the various notes which the huntsman could blow to tell where he was and what he was doing. Without these, the whole field would have been lost in two minutes, and even with them, about half of it was lost in three. Wart stuck to Twighty like a burr. He could move as quickly as the huntsman, because although the latter had the experience of a lifetime, he himself was smaller to get through obstacles, and had, moreover, been taught by Maid Marian. He noticed that Robin kept up, too, but soon the grunting of Sir Ector and the baaing of King Pellinor were left behind. Sir Grumor had given in early, having had most of the breath knocked out of him by the boar, and stood far in the rear, declaring that his spear could no longer be quite sharp. Kay had stayed with him so that he should not get lost. The foot people had been early mislaid because they did not understand the notes of the horn. Merlin had torn his breeches and stopped to mend them up by magic. The sergeant-at-arms had thrown out his chest so far in crying, Tally-ho! and telling everybody which way they ought to run, that he had lost all sense of place, and was leading a disconsolate party of villagers in Indian file, at the double, with knees up, in the wrong direction. Hob was still in the running. Swef, swef, panted the hunts huntsman, addressing the ward as if he had been a hound. Not so fast, master, they're going off the line. Even as he spoke, Wart noticed that the hound music was weaker and more querulous. Stop, said Robin, or we may tumble over him. The music died away. Swef, swef, shouted Master Twighty at the top of his voice. Sto a re, sto how, so how. He swung his baldric in front of him and lifting the horn to his lips, began to blow a rechit. There was a single note from one of the limers. Who are they? cried the huntsman. The limer's note grew in confidence, faltered, then rose to the full bay. Sto are they? so how, so how, hark to my Beaumont, the valiant. Ho moy, ho moy, ho lay, ho lay, ho lay. The limer was taken up by the tenor bells of the breeches. The noises of the dogs grew to a crescendo of excitement as the bloodthirsty thunder of the allants pealed through the lesser notes. They have him, said Twighty briefly, and the three humans began to run again, while the huntsman blew encouragement with true roo roo. In a small bushment, the grimly boar stood at bay. He had got his hindquarters into the nook of a tree, blown down by a gale, in an impregnable position. He stood on the defensive, with his upper lip writhed back in a snarl. The blood of Sir Grumor's gash welled fatly among the bristles of his shoulder and down his leg, while the foam of his chops dropped on the blushing snow and melted it. His small eyes darted in every direction. The hounds stood round, yelling at his mask, and Beaumont, with his back broken, writhed at his feet. The boar paid no further attention to the living hound, which could do him no harm. He was black, flaming, and bloody. So, ho, said the huntsman. He advanced with his spear held in front of him, and the hounds, encouraged by their master, stepped forward with him pace by pace. The scene changed as suddenly as a house of cards falling down. The boar was not at bay any more, but charging Master Twighty. As it charged, the allants closed in, seizing it fiercely by the shoulder or throat or leg, so that what, herged, what surged down on the huntsman was not one boar, but a bundle of animals. He dared not use his spear for fear of hurting the dogs. 
The bundle rolled forward unchecked as if the hounds... Let me start that one again. The bundle rolled forward unchecked as if the hounds did not impede it at all. Twighty began to reverse his spear to keep the charge off with its butt end, but even as he reversed it, the tussle of animals was upon him. He sprang back, tripped over a root, and the battle closed on top. The wart pranced round the edge, waving his own spear in an agony, but there was nowhere where he dared to thrust it in. Robin dropped his spear, drew his falchion in the same moment, stepped into a huddle of snarls and calmly picked an allant up by the leg. The dog did not let go, but there was space where its body had been. Into this space, the falchion went slowly, once, twice, thrice. The whole superstructure stumbled, recovered itself, stumbled again, and sank down ponderously on its left side. The hunt was over. Master Twighty drew one leg slowly from under the boar, stood up, took hold of his knee with his right hand, moved it inquiringly in various directions, nodded to himself, and stretched his back straight. Then he picked up his spear without saying anything and limped over to Beaumont. He knelt down beside him and took his head on his lap. He stroked, Beaumont, he stroked Beaumont's head and said, Hark to Beaumont, softly Beaumont, mon ami. Oyez a Beaumont, the valiant. Swef, le douce Beaumont, swef, swef. Beaumont licked his hand but could not wag his tail. The huntsman nodded to Robin, who was standing behind, and held the hound's eyes with his own. He said, Good dog, Beaumont the Valiant. Sleep now, old friend Beaumont. Good old dog. Then Robin's falchion let Beaumont out of this world to run free with Orion and roll among the stars. The wart did not like to watch Master Twighty for a moment. The strange, leathery man stood up without saying anything and whipped the hounds off the corpse of the boar as he was accustomed to do. He put his horn to his lips and blew the four long notes of the mort without a quaver. But he was blowing the notes for a different reason, and he startled the wart because he seemed to be crying. The mort brought most of the stragglers up in due time. Hob was there already and Sir Ector came next, whacking the brambles aside with his boar spear, puffing importantly and shouting, Well done, Twighty! Splendid hunt! Very! That's the way to chase a beast of venery, I will say. What does he weigh? The others dribbled in by batches, King Pellinor bounding along and crying out, Tally-ho! Tally-ho! in ignorance that the hunt was done. When informed of this, he stopped and said, tally ho what in a feeble voice then relapsed into silence even the sergeant's indian file arrived in the end still doubling with knees up and were halted in the clearing while the sergeant explained to them with great satisfaction that if it had not been for him all would have been lost merlin appeared holding up his running shorts having failed in his magic Sir Grumor came stumping along with Kay, saying that it had been one of the finest points he had ever seen run, although he had not seen it, and then the butcher's business of the undoing was proceeded with apace. Over this, there was a bit of excitement. King Pellinor, who had really been scarcely himself all day, made the fatal mistake of asking when the hounds were going to be given their quarry. Now, as everybody knows, a quarry is a reward of entrails, etc., which is given to the hounds on the hide of the dead beast, sur le cuir. And as everybody else knows, a slain boar is not skinned. It is disemboweled without the hide being taken off, and since there can be no hide, there can be no quarry. We all know that the hounds are rewarded with a fouet, or mixture of bowels and bread cooked over a fire. And of course, poor King Pellinor had used the wrong word. So, King Pellinor was bent over the dead beast amid loud huzzas, and the protesting monarch was given a hearty smack with a sword blade by Sir Ector. 
The king then said, I think you are all a lot of beastly cads, and wandered off mumbling into the forest. The boar was undone, the hounds rewarded, and the foot people, standing about in chattering groups because they would have got wet if they had sat down in the snow, ate the provisions which the young women had brought in baskets. A small barrel of wine, which had been thoughtfully provided by Sir Ector, was broached, and a good drink was had by all. The boar's feet were tied together, a pole was slipped between his legs, and the two men hoisted it upon their shoulders. William Twighty stood back and courteously blew the prees. It was at this moment that King Pellinore reappeared. Even before he came into view, they could hear him crashing in the undergrowth and calling out, I say, I say, come here at once. A, a most dreadful thing has happened. He appeared dramatically upon the edge of the clearing, just as a disturbed branch, whose burden was too heavy, emptied a couple of hundred weight of snow on his head. King Pellinore paid no attention. He climbed out of the snow heap as if he had not noticed it, still calling out, I say, I say. What is it, Pellinore? shouted Sir Ector. Oh, come quick, cried the king, and turning round distracted, he vanished again into the forest. Is he all right? inquired Sir Ector. Do you suppose? Excitable character, said Sir Grumor. Very. Better follow up and see what he's doing. The procession moved off sedately in King Pellinore's direction, following his erratic course by the fresh tracks in the snow. The spectacle which they came across was one for which they were not prepared. In the middle of a dead gorse bush, King Pellinore was sitting, with the tears streaming down his face. In his lap there was an enormous snake's head, which he was patting. At the other end of the snake's head, there was a long, lean, yellow body with spots on it. At the end of the body, there were some lion's legs, which ended in the slots of a heart. There, there, the king was saying. I, I did not mean to leave you all together. It was only because I wanted to sleep in a feather bed just for a bit. I was coming back, honestly, I was. Oh, Please don't die, beast, and leave me without any fumets. When he saw Sir Ector, the king took command of the situation. Desperation had given him authority. Now then, Ector, he exclaimed, don't stand there like a ninny. Fetch that barrel of wine along at once. They brought the barrel and poured out a generous tot for the questing beast. Poor creature, said King Pellinore indignantly. It has pined away, positively pined away, just because there was nobody to take an interest in it. How I could have stayed all that while with Sir Grumore and never given my old beast a thought, I really don't know. Look at its ribs, I ask you, like the hoops of a barrel, and lying out in the snow all by itself, almost without the will to live. Come on, beast. You see if you can't get down another gulp of this. It will do you good. Mollicking about in a feather bed, added the remorseful monarch, glaring at Sir Grumor. Like, like a kidney. But how did you, how did you find it? faltered Sir Grumor. I happened on it, and small thanks to you, running about like a lot of nincompoops and smacking each other with swords. I happened on it in this gorse bush here with snow all over its poor back and tears in its eyes and nobody to care for it in the wide world. It's what comes of not reading, not leading a regular life. Before, it was all right. We got up at the same time and quested for regular hours and went to bed at half past ten. Now look at it. It has gone to pieces altogether, and it will be your fault if it dies, you and your bed. But, Pellinore, said Sir Grumor, shut your mouth, replied the king at once. Don't stand there bleeding like a fool, man. Do something. Fetch another pole so that we can carry old Gladys Aunt home. Now then, Hector, haven't you got any sense? We must just carry him home and put him in front of the kitchen fire. 
Send somebody on to make some bread and milk. And you, twighty, or whatever you calls, choose to call yourself, stop fiddling with that trumpet of yours and run ahead to get some blankets warmed. When we get home, concluded King Pellinore, the first thing will be to give it a nourishing meal. And then, if it is all right in the morning, I will give it a couple of hours' start, and then hey-ho for the old life once again. What about that, Glatisant, eh? You'll tack the high road, and I'll tack the low road. What? Come along, Robin Hood, or wh whoever you are. You may think I don't know, but I do. Stop leaning on your bow with that look of negligent woodcraft. Pull yourself together, man, and get that muscle-bound sergeant to help you carry her. Now, lift her easy. Come along, you chuckleheads, and mind you don't trip. Feather beds and quarry, indeed. A lot of childish nonsense. Go on, advance, proceed, step forward, march. Feather brains, I call it. That's what I do. And as for you, Grammore, added the king, even after he had concluded, you can just roll yourself up in your bed and stifle in it. Um, I'm going to start the next chapter just for a little bit. So, Chapter 17. I think it must be time, said Merlin, looking at him over the top of his spectacles one afternoon, that you had another dose of education. That is, as time goes. It was an afternoon in early spring, and everything outside the window looked beautiful. The winter mantle had gone, taking with it Sir Grumor, Master Twighty, King Pellinore, and the questing beast, the latter having revived under the influence of kindliness and bread and milk. It had bounded off into the snow with every sign of gratitude, to be followed two hours later by the excited king and the watchers from the battlements had observed it conf confusing its snowy footprints most ingeniously as it reached the edge of the chase. It was running backward, bounding twenty foot sideways, rubbing out its marks with its tail, climbing along horizontal branches, and performing many other tricks with evident enjoyment. They had also seen King Pellinore, who had dutifully kept his eyes shut and counted ten thousand while this was going on, <clears throat> becoming quite confused when he arrived at the difficult spot and finally galloping off in the wrong direction with his brachet, brachet or brachet trailing behind him. It was a lovely afternoon. Outside the schoolroom window, the larches of the distant forest had already taken on the fullness of their dazzling green. The earth twinkled and swelled with a million drops, and every bird in the world had come home to court and sing. The village folk were forth in their gardens every evening, planting garden beans, and it seemed that, what with these emergencies and those of the slugs, coincidentally with the beans, the buds, the lambs, and the birds, every living thing had conspired to come out. What would you like to be? asked Merlin. Wart looked out of the window, listening to the thrush's twice, dawn's, twice done song of dew. He said, I have been a bird once, but it was only in the mews at night, and I never got a chance to fly. Even if one ought not to do one's education twice, do you think I could be a bird so as to learn about that? He had been bitten with the craze for birds, which bites all sensible people in the spring, and which sometimes even leads to excesses, like birds nesting. I can see no reason why you should not, said the magician. Why not try it at night? But they will be asleep at night. All the better chance of seeing them without their flying away. You could go with Archimedes this evening, and he would tell you about them. Would you do that, Archimedes? I should love to, said the owl. I was feeling like a little saunter myself. Do you know, asked the wart, thinking of the thrush, why birds sing or how? Is it a language? Of course it is a language. It is not a big language like human speech, but it is large. Gilbert White, said Merlin, remarks, or, or will remark, however you like to put it, that the language of birds is very ancient, and like other ancient modes of speech, 
little is said, but much is intended. He also says somewhere that the rooks in the breeding season attempt sometimes in the gaiety of their hearts to sing, but with no great success. I love rooks, said the wart. It is funny, but I think they are my favorite bird. Why? asked Archimedes. Well, I, I like them. I like their sauce. Neglectful parents, quoted Merlin, who is in a scholarly mood, and saucy, perverse children. It is true, said Archimedes reflectively, that all the Corvidae have a distorted sense of humor. And I think I'm going to stop there, because it is now 8 o'clock, and we now begin a new adventure, um, one of my favorites, where Wart gets to see a little of the world. Um, but we will come back to that next weekend, assuming that everything is normal, 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 um, as I'm hoping it will be, so I can have a work week full of non-distractions and get some things done. But in the interim, um, I want to say thank you so much for joining me. As always, muchísimas gracias. Uh, merci beaucoup. A tout. Um, und uh, vielen Dank. And with that, I thank you all, and I hope I got most people there. Um, and until uh, I return, I hope you will all take very good care of yourselves, um, your loved ones, your family, friends and neighbors. We will all help to take care of each other. And that way, we will all make it through this thing called life, brothers and sisters, as Prince once said. Uh, so anyway, with that, I say... Good to see you. Thanks for joining me so much. And I will see you next week. So ciao ragazzi. <laughs>